Pat Kilpatrick, who has worked as a fundraiser at Disability Rights Advocates, speaks in Sweden about fundraising and ways that Swedish disability rights organisations can raise money for sustainable legal action. Pat Kirkpatrick, who has worked as a fundraiser at Disability Rights Advocates, speaks at the conference and seminars in Sweden about fundraising and ways in which the Swedish disability organisations can potentially raise money and resources through innovative fundraising that provides support for sustainable legal actions and work. So I'm, I've been talking to many of you <laughs> many times about fundraising and how disability rights advocates is where it is today after 24 years. And I, I was the fundraiser, uh, I was hired as the fundraiser for disability rights advocates for 17 years. I have now retired and I'm on the board of disability rights advocates doing the same thing I did for, for pay, now for free. <laughs> So not so smart, <laughs> but I have a lot of wisdom to impart. <laughs> so I, I want to kind of quickly move through parts of what I've told you before and then talk about uh, more about how people with disabilities become much more involved so that this is a successful effort we're making here for the future. Um, as I said before, our sources of funding in America, and perhaps to some extent here, are through foundations, governments, corporations, family funds, individuals, law firms as sponsors and providing pro bono work, uh, crowdfunding, which is an online form of fundraising for a targeted issue and in-kind contributions, donations of uh, rental space or furniture or whatever. Um, in terms of an organization, you must start with your leaders and board development. And hopefully your board and your advisory board has many members from the disability community working with you to lead the charge and to direct the cases and issues that you focus on. Uh, so that, that's absolutely the start. Um, we've done a lot of targeting fun targeted funding uh, as well as trying to get general support for our organization. And um, we have focused on different cases. Um, I, I think I've told you about the veterans case, but some of you haven't heard it. Um, we, our board, well, our lawyers decided that they felt um, it was a moral imperative to file a lawsuit against the Department of Veterans Affairs for its failure to provide health care in a timely manner to the veterans coming back, actually back as far as the Vietnam War, but certainly the Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, we realized that there would be no attorney's fees realized through this case, so we decided instead to go to our public, to our donors, and some of our donors, who were also lawyers, happened to be veterans. And they said, let us take this on. Let us get, we know lots of people who would be interested in this case. And the result of which, they asked many people, and we got $750,000 to put that case together to hire experts to go to court. It was a trial. And it was a <coughs> monumental effort, which, the result of which is we actually lost the case but we won many advances, one of which is the suicide hotline for the 17 vets per day were committing suicide at that time. So we were able to get the hotlines staffed in a way that they could really help the individuals. And we, through our media work, 
Um, there were so many articles written on our case that the result was that Shinseki, the head of the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs, was ultimately fired. So we did not win in the court of law, but we won through the media. And I, I also, you know, the, the involvement, we had so many veterans groups who were our plaintiffs, and they would go out and protest during the time of the case, they'd, they'd have banners and they would talk with the news media. They were in the courthouse every day. So we had the validity and the credibility because we had the groups that were directly impacted by this breach uh, of um, you know, provision of services by the VA. They were there every day. And I think that's so important in all of our cases that we take on. The, um, most of our plaintiffs are disability organizations, not individuals. They're all class actions, so they're groups. And they attend every proceeding in the court. And they talk to the media. They are the face that is presented to the media. So we educate the greater public about, A, what our organization is doing, but B, that there are a lot of people with disabilities in the universe that need housing, that need education, that demand employment, that whatever case we're working on. So I think that's a very um, critical role you play and must play. Um, interestingly, we have something in the states called the Disability Funders Network, and it's a group of organizations that are disability focused and people with disabilities who get appointments with heads of foundations and heads of corporations in their diversity division and sit down with them and talk to them about what are you funding in the area of disability. And often it's a pretty embarrassing exercise because usually they say, well, what do you mean even, you know? And, and so it's a matter of you educating the funders, as we have over the years, um, what disability rights is, not what um, benefits, uh, you know, disability benefits or social security disability income is, but what rights are to live in the society fully. And um, this Disability Funders Network has been very effective for all of us because we now have all identified the groups that are friendly toward our issues. And it pushes other foundations and corporations to, to do more in that area. So I recommend that to you. Um, we have had many. Uh, Oh, so, so our board is very solid. We have 19 members. They're both from the disability community and they're from the legal world and corporate world. But most people are lawyers of some kind or another. I'm not, but you know, I'm a fundraiser. So that's a good thing to have on your board too. Um, but we have encouraged all of our board members to be very active in providing home Hmm? what we call home events in their homes or, in, or rent a hall okay. and invite their friends and their contacts to this event to, to get more people aware of the work we're doing and to gather more friends and ultimately donors. And this is how you start to build a foundation of people who support you. As you know, or I've told you in other lectures, we started with 11 donors, and we now have way over 500 donors just as individuals. And that requires many more people than your staff. It requires your board and your advisory board to equally get involved and think, you know, I think this person would be interested in what we're doing. We'll invite them. Um, we also. Um, and I'm telling you this for a purpose, we also give out Eagle Awards each year in, I know you, you don't necessarily have gala dinners or big events that are fundraisers. We do. This is something very American and, you know, every nonprofit group has their gala event and invites the media and invites sometimes politicians and dig dignitaries and society people and civil society, of course. But um, 
you know, then we always honor someone. So we, we give out eagle awards. Um, eagles are rare birds that soar high, and we think of them as quite regal. And so they're the organizations and corporations that have advanced the rights of people with disabilities, and we think are deserving of such an award. And one of the awards we're going to give next year, I told you about Starbucks, and we have many reasons for giving to them, but um, we're giving to something called the Museum Access Consortium in New York. And this is something I've told you, New York, we have a second office in New York at six years old, and New York is, is the worst place for a person with a disability to live in the world. It's the most inaccessible, inhospitable place. So that's why we moved our office, our second office, to New York and to really change the whole setting for, and, and conditions for people with disabilities. But we learned that the museums have something that's a, exemplary and role model for all museum groups in the world to do, and that is they have established a steering committee of people with disabilities who t and, and many different disabilities, from cognitive disabilities to mental disabilities to the, the usual disabilities we think of, and they sit on this panel and they tell them why it's important for them to be able to enter a museum and really understand art. And so I went on several of these workshops and they were just great. Uh, one was for people who are blind and they did a whole, it was a whole, um, it was an Islamic art exhibition and they had us touching all the um, mosaics, feeling them going in and talking about envisioning the position of the painting and what it looked like. And they even had those with a little bit of vision draw what they saw on these things that raised in bas relief what they drew. It was, it was wonderful. All, all to say in a very short amount of time is that this was an example of something that we could export everywhere in the world to think of a corporation having on their board people with disabilities and they would do the right thing, you know, nothing without us, as you would say. And they got it right from the start. And every museum is exceptionally accessible in all sorts of ways. And in fact, the 9-11 uh, Museum, which is a recent museum, as you know, they invited Sid and me to walk through the museum with them. They had a deaf blind and wheelchair user on staff who went with us and we were to tell them all the problems that we saw and we still saw problems with access especially in the the um, description plates which were not high contrast enough and several details this was extraordinary that they really were so proactive so we will give them an Eagle Award next year at the Museum of Modern Art, which has been donated to us for this purpose next year. And we'll probably have about 500 guests, and we'll probably raise about $750,000 at that dinner. So I'm, I'm wanting you to reach for the stars when you're thinking about this. And when I think about the strategy for Sweden, the first one is to, to establish a good board who knows that they will be asked to give and they will be asked to find people who can support this cause and who will perhaps help you organize friend raising events. Um, I would set up a group of people with disabilities now to go to corporations, meet with the diversity managers, see what they have to say about funding in general and then specifically to your issues. Start the dialogue. Start it now. Get, get your foot in the door first. Um, plan a fundraising event for a year and a half from now. Two years. Okay, two years. <laughs> you know, and think about it. Think small, but think of a, a really nice event. You can be the first ones to actually do such a thing with your organization. I mean, we've seen over 100 people in the last three days that should come to this event, and I'm sure there are many more. And when you file a legal case, and I know you're going to get to that point where you file big cases, use the media as a tool to advance your cause, have 
people within the civil society attending the court proceedings and organize protests around the cause that you're uh, pushing forward. And when you're organized sufficiently and have enough funding, hire a fundraiser. I, I can't stress that enough. You cannot do it all. You have to have someone absolutely dedicated to doing this for you. And they don't have to work full time, but they have to absolutely have on their mind all the time about giving you support for all that you are doing. It's such an important issue, and I, I know there are people and, and entities who will give you money ultimately. So that is my spiel for the day. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it was what you wanted, Paul. <laughs> could, could, could you say something quickly about Turkey Awards? Oh, sure, yeah, and then Liza, I'll get to you. Yeah, I, I eliminated the turkeys, which are, of course, my idea and Sid's and, and the most fun. We used to give Eagle and Turkey Awards, and of course the Eagles advance were the entities that did good work in advancing the rights of people with disabilities and the turkeys were the losers. They were impeding the rights of people with disabilities. And so we would have an event annually and the turkeys would not come to the <laughs> event. So we sent them their plaque and, uh, but we had to have, we, I will tell you honestly, we let them know in advance and they have an opportunity to repair the damage and actually our uh, local um, metro system had, we had sued them previously, but they had fallen far behind and the elevators were being used <coughs> again as urinals and the elevators weren't being repaired and all this. So we wrote to them and we said, we are, our committee is thinking of uh, giving you a turkey award this year. Boy, they went to action and no turkey award. We didn't give them an eagle yet, but we persuaded them to do something with no litigation and they got it done. And uh, we, we didn't realize that those awards, although maybe slightly embarrassing and maybe in your culture it would be absolutely impossible to do, but they have their their place. <laughs> so Lars, you were going to ask me a question. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you one. Uh, thank you very much, by the way. I oh, think this is such you. an important uh, topic oh, thank here. You, you know, we, yeah. we don't really have a, a very strong tradition, oh. you know, fundraising in this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I would say fundraising of this sort also is a little bit here, uh, I think, associated with charity, which mm -hmm. you know, has mm -hmm. had a bad name sure, for sure. quite a while. Yeah. So it, Plus, we've had this relation to the state. You know, yeah. there's an expectation, yeah. right? That, yeah. yeah. So it, it's it's a new thing. I think it's very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. But I, I have a question that is, in a way, a little different. I'm sure that Adolf and I will get back to these questions in our conversation. But it was um, about um, how social media and crowd fundraising, and how that may or may not have changed the landscape for you. I, I mm -hmm. was reminded just very recently of a, a friend of mine who has a son who was struck by cancer and he, mm -hmm. you know, has exhausted all treatments here in Sweden, you know, under the, you know, health mm -hmm. insurance program here. And so there is a, an opportunity for, for treatment in New York, in fact. And, um, and he, I, I was, as a naive Swede, I was kind of, like, when he told me he was going to go out and do crowd fundraising, uh, via basically at Facebook, I, I, mm. yeah, I, I couldn't imagine how, how that would really work. Yeah. And he raised $250,000 right, within I weeks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I, was, I was just completely sort of awestruck by that. And I thought to myself, being an old fuddy duddy, you know, yeah. I'm not as in touch, you know, with this kind of new world. But it made me think when I listen yes. to you, you know, that maybe this provides a whole other set of opportunities. Well, well. and I want to say you could certainly be on the cutting edge here. I think DRA and, and my old tech skills <laughs> weren't applied to that kind of crowdfunding long ago when I started, but I have certainly seen a lot of nonprofits in, the, in many worlds, but in the disability arena, crowdfund very successfully. Um, you know, it depends on what the issue and how compelling and who it goes out to, but absolutely with a targeted issue. Um, I know a friend crowdfunded, she had cancer too and she needed money for treatments and I sent money. I mean, it was just yeah. not even a question, of course. Yeah. Um, no, and of course- small amounts too, so it's a, 
I had one other question mm -hmm. for you, and mm -hmm. I'm sure others will sure. step in, and that is more of a sort of tactical or strategic, perhaps, question really is. And I was wondering, when you do your fundraising, is it for specific um, lawsuits or or projects, or, mm -hmm. or do you work on building a downment for, for mm -hmm. kind of more sort of autonomy in the future? Like, you know, mm -hmm. how do you think about that? Because that's kind of... That's such a good question, because I've kind of done it all. I. Um, we haven't built an endowment, but we did build, um, I will say, it was my idea, a Sid Walensky Legal Fellowship Fund at DRA. And Sid, having practiced for 50 years in the legal arena, he's very well known. He truly is a legend, even though I'm his wife, so I'm biased. <laughs> but uh, just his name. She doesn't say this at home. No. <laughs> Only in public. <laughs> no, but I'm, I, I raised $1.4 million in, in two years, and I want to say people thought it was the best idea. And the reason it was 1.4 is we hoped we would, we would keep it as an endowment, and er, every year 5% would yield 70000 which is the cost required to hire a new law student to work at DRA for a year with benefits and with some loan repayment in addition to a fair salary. It's not a starting salary at a big corporate law firm, but it's a fair salary. So we raised that money and, and you know, that's probably by dint also of who this guy is. But um, we have raised money for um, general support is our best support. I mean, you just want to be able to use the money as you wish to for salaries, for events, for whatever. It's hard to get that money. You can certainly get seed money. We got two grants when we started DRA of about 70000 but that was a lot of money then, to start our organization. There's planning grant money just to kind of figure it out and develop a website and, you know, just first steps. Um, and then we actually raised money to buy a part of our building that we're in. And that was also a compelling, people got plaques, people who gave 10,000 or more got to own a room in the, in the <laughs> office or the bathroom. Or, that was 5,000. Or the conference room, that was 25,000. So, yeah. I, I realize I was remiss as moderator. I should have said that we have to have a break at five minutes to three. Oh, okay. So I'm suggesting we have a break at now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in, rega in regards to just this last point, I'd like to point out one idea that I've, I've seen in the US, and it does occur even in Sweden, but NGOs also try to own property. Mm -hmm. They don't rent, or they don't necessarily want to rent. Mm -hmm. Whereas quite often here, civil society has the idea that, well, renting is bad, or owning is bad. Oh. And it's a lot harder to shut down organizations that own their own property. Yeah. Uh, that's just a... I, and, and funders, I mean, you think that funders want to fund something always new and in need, desperate need of money. Actually, I've found funders love to fund success. When they see that you are fiscal, fiscally responsible and that you do what you say you're going to do and you have really thought through the finances um, and you're extremely effective as DRA, they want to fund you. They want to put their money on the winning horse, not just throw it in the wind. <laughs>